Hello, welcome to our next lesson, Evaluating Statistical Arguments. When evaluating statistical arguments, uh, these kinds of arguments must pass both the true premises and the proper form test. Some other things to look out for is that the sample must be representative. If you have a statistical argument where the sample is not representative, then it will not pass the proper form test. That is, even if all the premises are true, the conclusion still does not fo follow because the sample was not representative. And what is it for a sample to be representative? This is when the proportions of every subgroup in the target are generally matched by the proportions of the subgroup in the sample. So if you are running a political poll, for example, to test to see to get a pulse of the United States to see which candidate in a presidential election uh, had the advantage. There are many different subgroups in the United States. You can have subgroups based on race, socioeconomic class, based on gender, sexual orientation, age, etc. And so in order to have a, a representative sample when you're interviewing or asking questions for uh, in regards to your sample, to then try to extrapolate a conclusion about the country as a whole, well your sample needs to be uh, it needs to be representative. Now, representativeness comes in degrees, and it's very difficult in many cases to get a precisely representative sample. Sometimes you can have an obviously unrepresentative sample. For example, returning to our political poll case, if you were to run a poll and you, let's say, you only interviewed people who were conservative, that's it. You didn't interview anyone who, were, who was moderate or who was more on the liberal side. Well, in that case, you shouldn't trust the results right, of the survey. Even if all the premises are true, since it's not representative, the sample is not representative, the conclusion is not warranted. Uh, so you should try to have a representative sample as best as possible. And it can come in matters of degree. And in many cases, you shouldn't expect to get a perfectly representative sample. Uh, there may be, for example, too many subgroups, and it's difficult to identify all the various subgroups. Those could be possible problems in why you cannot get a, an exactly representative sample. But once again, you can make statistical arguments so long as they're generally representative. They don't have to be necessarily exactly uh, representative. Okay, so this term, biased sample, that's when the proportions of every subgroup in the target do not match the proportions of the subgroups in the sample. So, technically speaking, that is when the term biased sample comes into play. And uh, as we, we're going to see when we talk more about the uh, kinds of fallacies that can be in play for statistical arguments, there can be a biased sample fallacy. And we can understand why it's called a bias sample, and that's because the sample might be too biased towards a particular subgroup and may not contain enough uh, uh, participants in a different sample, subsample group. For example, if you were to, let's say you're part of a marketing team and you're trying to market a particular product and you only ran surveys or studies on people in one age demographic, let's say 18 to 25. Well, just from that uh, demographic, you cannot then you would not be warranted in drawing conclusions about what people from 25 to 35 and 35 to 50 and 50 to you know 70, what they would think about this product because your sample, the, the, the people that you have observed through and interviewed, uh, it's biased, right? It's biased too much towards one subgroup and it needs to be more representative. Here are some general guidelines for samples. The larger the sample size, the more likely it's representative. So the larger the sample size, the more people, let's say, that are interviewed or tested or what have you, the more likely it's going to be representative. And this is just itself kind of based on probability. 
right? The more people who are interviewed, the more chance, the more opportunity that you have uh, various subjects that uh, come from different subgroups. And what also helps, when, uh, not only having a larger sample size, but having a random sample, where you don't, for example, returning back to our political poll case, you do not, for example, only give out, let's say, 5,000 questionnaires only to Democrats, but not any to any moderates or Republicans. Right? That, uh, if you do something like that, even though it's a large sample, uh, then it's still not going to be representative enough. But if you have a random sample, and let's say you just randomly hand them out to people, maybe in a public place or what have you, something like that, uh, and it's not at a, for example, a democratic convention or something like that where you're running the sample, but you have a random sample and it's a very large sample, then that will uh, help help the study itself be more representative and warrant drawing a stronger conclusion. Second, the more varied the sample, the more likely it's representative. Right? Have some variety within the sample, make it more representative, the more likely it's uh, uh, to have more variety in the sample, the more likely it's going to be representative. Uh, so you could hand some out maybe at a Republican convention or and at a Democratic convention. Right? You vary it up, then it, th there will be a greater likelihood that the sample will be representative. Okay, now let's discuss some statistical fallacies. The first one is the fallacy of hasty generalization. This occurs when a statistical argument uses a sample that's too small. The sample size is just too small to warrant drawing the conclusion that it attempts to draw. Here's one example where this fallacy is committed. Say this, my Irish roommate likes to drink whiskey. So, all Irish people must like to drink whiskey. This is the fallacy, this commits the fallacy of hasty generalization. It's trying to draw a broad conclusion on the target, the target here is all Irish people, merely based on one example, right? merely based on one example that this person has had with their Irish roommate. That, this kind of argument itself the induction is not warranted because the sample size is too small. If you want to draw a conclusion about, let's say, all people from Ireland or maybe in biology, for example, about all giraffes, if you want to say all giraffes have this particular quality, well, you cannot be warranted in drawing that conclusion if it's only based on looking at one giraffe or one Irish person. Right? You need many. Uh, you need many uh, your uh, many instances and subjects to look at in order to warrant drawing a conclusion, and the larger your sample size, the more the greater the degree of warrant uh, is uh, contained in the conclusion. Okay, so the next fallacy is the biased sample fallacy, and this occurs when a sample has a serious lack of variety. So, as we should expect, as we've talked about a biased sample before, this is where a uh, a sample doesn't have enough variety. Now, it could be the case, and in many times it is the case, the sample is not 100% representative of all the various different subgroups in the target. That's fine. Rather, this bias sample fallacy comes in when there is a serious lack of variety. Here's one example case. Someone might argue this. All humans generally are wild and vivacious based on a study on 1 million high school students. Notice here the sample size is quite large, so this does not commit the fallacy of hasty generalization. This study was run on 1 million human beings. However, it's only been run on 1 million high school students who are young and more vivacious. right? And so since this is unrepresentative, the conclusion about all human beings being wild and vivacious is not warranted given how unrepresented and how biased the sample is towards younger humans. Okay, next fallacy is the fallacy of biased question. This occurs when a survey asks for information with a question which is intentionally or unintentionally worded in a way that tends to encourage a particular response. So questions, people can give different answers to the same question depending upon how 
the question is worded and how the question is phrased, how the question is even framed. Um, there, there's this interesting uh, phenomenon in psychology called framing effects, where how you frame a question can lead to differences in answers. Uh, the fallacy of bias question is where you lead a question uh, or you pose a question where uh, it can lead to a kind of bias depending upon how you word or present the question itself. To give you an example of this is more people will support an economic policy in a survey if the employment rate of the policy is emphasized than when the associated unemployment rate is highlighted. So if if someone were to run a political survey asking whether or not they, people generally agree with this economic policy, and they say something like, this economic policy employs 90% uh, of the people in the United States, well then more people will tend to support the economic policy. But if you say, do you support this economic policy where there, the unemployment rate is 10%, then more people are likely to uh, disagree with the uh, question uh, or with, with, with the economic policy itself. So it's important to try to avoid these kinds of questions or wording questions in a way that people can give different answers based on a slight, on how you kind of word the question itself, even though the information is uh, kind of still the same as it was if you worded it a different way. Because having a 90% employment rate is the same thing as having a, uh, including a 10% unemployment rate. And vice versa, having a 10% unemployment rate is uh, also having 90% employment. But depending upon which one of those numbers you emphasize in the question, people will give different answers uh, to that question. Okay, so let's look at some exercises here. What fallacy is at hand, if any? Hasty generalization, bias sample, bias question. It could be the case that two or more of these fallacies are at play for the same issue. Let's look at number one. Five Green Party members I have known are all French. Ralph Nader is a Green Party member, therefore Ralph is probably French. What fallacy, if any, is here? One thing here is, well, the Green Party is a political party, and the sample size is only five. Uh, so you need a much larger sample size in this particular case uh, to draw a conclusion generally about the Green Party, which then, you, from there, you can extrapolate a particular statistical argument or conclusion in regards to Ralph Nader. So the sample size is too small. So this has a hasty generalization uh, fallacy. And uh, one thing I did not mention previously, we can understand why it's called a hasty generalization. And that's because you draw an induction, a statistical induction or generalization about the target, right? But in this case, it's the entire Green Party. And then later, more in particular, Ralph Nader. But you draw a generalization about the Green Party, but you, it's too hasty because your sample size is not yet large enough. Okay, are there any other fallacies uh, at play here? Uh, not maybe explicitly, but there could be a bias sample fallacy here. Um, so the Green Party is an American party here in the United States. So it just so happens that the Green Party members are French, uh, or perhaps of French ancestry. Maybe this was done in a this survey or this experience with these five Green Party members was in a location, maybe in the United States, in which there is a heavy French population. Uh, so uh, in this particular situation, it could be the case that there is a bias sample, uh, because Green Party generally has a lot of people who do not necessarily have French ancestry. In fact, most of them uh, would not have uh, in, at least immediate French ancestry, such that we could say that they're also French. Uh, so it, this could be the case that there's a bias sample uh, going on in this situation as well. All right, let's look at the next one. The three tigers in the San Diego Zoo all have stripes. Thus, all tigers probably have stripes. Here we see a conclusion that's trying to be drawn about all tigers, 
Right? All tigers in the world have stripes. And they're trying to justify this based on three tigers in the San Diego Zoo. Is there a fallacy going on here of the ones that have been uh, that are in play? Well, three tigers, that sample size is too small. So this is hasty generalization. When biologists draw conclusions about a species and say that a species has these particular kinds of qualities or properties, it's based on a very large sample size. And it's based on a representative sample size, especially if that animal is contained in various continents. It would be important for biologists to communicate or to travel to these various continents to also examine uh, how those animals are in different parts of the world. But here, we do not see this kind of representativeness. We only see an examination of tigers that happen to be in the San Diego Zoo. So this sample is not representative. So this contains the bias sample fallacy. Uh, so here in this situation, there are, this is doubly fallacious. Let's look at the next one. I ate at Charlie's restaurant 90 times, and the food was always pretty good. So I intend to eat there again today. It will probably be, probably be just as good today. Is there a fallacy here? Well, we can kind of go through a checklist. It's not a biased question fallacy because there is no question being posed here. Uh, is there a hasty generalization? Is the sample size too small? Well, 90 times eating at a restaurant and then trying to then conclude that you know generally the, the food will be good the next time I eat there, such as today. 90 times, that's a pretty large sample size in this case. So this is not a hasty general generalization fallacy. Uh, does it commit the biased sample fallacy? Well, in this case, we're only talking about one restaurant here, Charlie's Restaurant. So it's there's really uh, no uh, possibility or no instance of uh, expanded representatives such as looking at other restaurants or anything like that or getting experience of eating food at different restaurants or even different kinds of food because this argument is very much contained only to Charlie's restaurant uh, so uh, there is here no issue of the bias sample fallacy because there's really not much room to be more representative and there's no really no need to be more representative since the conclusion is only about this one particular restaurant. So there is no such fallacy, any of the above fallacies in play for this particular uh, problem. All right, so that concludes our lesson uh, on, uh, on this particular issue, and I will see you for the next lesson.